this is, uh, I've got 25 minutes, according to this computer here, and this much material, and you can tell from that far away that uh, uh, I have too much material. And by the way, these are IBM punch cards. <laughs> some of you will remember. And on that note, uh, I know I have gray hair and I'm going to, you know, I'm generally a cranky guy, but I want you to know I've always been cranky. This has not come with uh, advancing age. I'm from New York and uh, we're just cranky people. Uh, so today has been mentioned, it's the 40th, this year is the 40th birthday of Ethernet, but I think we should be focused tonight anyway on the 30th anniversary of the standardization of Ethernet. And so I'm going to I'm going to emphasize that. I've been asked to tell stories about the early days of Ethernet, and that's easy, that's easy for me to do. I mean, I've forgotten half of what happened, and I've made up the rest. So the <laughs> but I want to make three points tonight. One, the work that you all at 802 are doing is important. Two is the future of 802 is much bigger than its past. And three is this Ethernet brand that I'm going to describe a little later uh, works, and I urge you to stick with it in, as you go on to future challenges. That's the quick summary. And then uh, uh, I'll talk really quickly. I'll start speeding up now. I'll talk really quickly, but we'll have Q I hope we'll have time for Q&A during the panel session. So let me go to 802 minus infinity. MIT 1968, I took three courses, 6.70, 6.711, 6, and 6721. And under 6721, I was to build, help, part of a team to build a computer, and I chose to build the memory. And instead of using core memory, I decided to build a memory out of an acoustic delay line. Does anyone know what an acoustic delay line is? Yeah, the bits sort of travel through this cable at the speed of sound through this cable. And it's a funny thing is the cable doesn't go from point A to point B, it goes from point A to point A because the purpose of it is not to transmit the bits through space, but instead to transmit them through time. So with the TTL MSI logic that we had, I built the memory, which consisted of a device to send a pulse down this cable and follow it with a stream of bits, which was the contents of the memory, being counted off by a counter and so on. So I'm here to admit that my first network device was a token ring. <laughs> In 1970, uh, a little bit later, I was asked to put MIT on the ARPANET, the then internet, and built my second high-speed network interface, depending on how you count, for the PDP-610, also built out of MSI TTL. It ran, it could run up to 300 kilobits per second. Each bit was acknowledged. Ready for next bit, ready for next bit. That was, be, that was just a flow control mechanism. And the, um, uh, Bob Bressler there, he wrote the NCP, that was the predecessor of TCP protocols that ran on top of this hardware to connect this PDP-6 and later a PDP-10 to the internet. And then I wrote a telnet. You all know what telnet is? The first application of the internet was telnet for logging into remote time sharing systems. So I wrote a telnet to run on Bob's NCP running on my hardware. And, uh, and then I wrote a survey program to survey the entire internet to see who else had successfully implemented telnet. And then we had a, a, a system programmers workshop where we invited everyone to come for a weekend and make their telnets work. And we had a big N by N matrix and we filled it in. And that was sort of an early uh, prototype of interop where we, we actually tested not certifiable, you know, not certification relative to standards, but actual interoperability tested and then and we fixed all the bugs that weekend. So ARPA's goal was to connect mini computers across the country so people could share them and ARPA could save money, wouldn't have to buy a, a mini computer for everybody. Uh, and they knew that some of the universities had more, than one univer uh, had more than one computer, so each IMP packet switch had four ports. And so at MIT, we used all four ports. We had three PDP-10s and a Multix connected to this IMP. And I want you to know we were embarrassed over time because most of the traffic generated by these machines never left the building. We had basically built the first LAN accidentally 
and we were and we were embarrassed to report that traffic. We called it incestuous traffic because it it never left the building. So then on to Xerox Park in '72, and and they asked me to do it again. So build another imp interface, which which I did. Uh, and then in 1973, we decided that we would use the Intel 1103 dynamic RAMs that were a hot new component, and we would build personal computers, and we would put one in every desk, and it got, got to be my job to uh, uh, network them, which is how the luckiest guy in the world got a problem that no one else had ever had, which is how do you network a building full of personal computers. So I bought a spool of coax, and started to launch pulses down to see what would happen. And they came out the other end, although rounded a bit. I noticed they were rounded. I put in square waves, and out came these sort of rounded things. And so while I was fiddling with this uh, coax, a guy, a, a young grad student across the room, noticed how bad I was at soldering and stripping insulation. So Dave Boggs came over and introduced himself, and then uh, we built the first uh, internet uh, Ethernet uh, together. It was 2.94 megabits per second. It could go up to a mile and have up to 255 uh, stations on it. Uh, we then used that to drive the first laser printer from the PCs. And then we, we needed to send packets among multiple Ethernets from multiple buildings, so we invented a protocol called PUP, the Park Universal Packet, which is very similar to, you might recognize it as IP if you want. So then in 1973, uh, the summer, uh, Professor Vince Cerf at Stanford held a seminar to design the next protocols for the internet. Uh, uh, NCP was the current network control program, was the current protocols, and we needed a new set, and those were called TCP IP. And it was during the summer of 83, 73 that the word internet began to emerge, but it began to emerge for two different reasons. Vince Cerf was interested in connecting an ARPANET in every country to the other ARPANETs in other countries, an internet. I was interested in getting all these LANs connected to each other and up into the internet. So both of us love the word internet, and, and it, uh, I guess you've noticed it caught on. Uh, so we, we took the ideas uh, to build, to get ethernet from the ARPANET, but also from the Aloha Packet Radio Network, which had a particularly clever access method, uh, uh, re randomized retransmissions, which we adopted for the early Ethernet. I, if anyone's new here, we don't do that anymore on Ethernet, but we did in uh, 1973. And a lot of people have asked me, since Aloha Network is a packet radio network, why did we not go directly to Wi-Fi? Instead of using coax and twisted pair and optical fibers, why didn't we just go right to Wi-Fi? And the answer was, is, was that the Aloha network radios ran at 4,800 bits per second and filled a, a six foot tall 19 inch rack. And Dave and I had 60 chips with which to build the entire ethernet. Actually 60 plus some extra ones because Dave, uh, drilled and soldered some extra chips on the edge of the card to squeeze them in. So that's why we didn't go direct to Wi-Fi. Uh, we then, uh, I moved across the street to Xerox System Development Division where we took the Alto and started working on a workstation called STAR. We took PUP and we started working on a network protocol called XNS, Xerox Network Systems. And then we took Ethernet and we started working on a product called The Xerox Wire was our, the name of it. Uh, after working on that a few years, left Xerox w without having shipped any products, I might add. They came out another year or two later. And I met a guy named Gordon Bell, who was then the VP. We're getting to, the, we're getting to 802 any minute now. I know, you're, <laughs> I know you're frustrated, but it's coming. Here it comes. So Gordon Bell, uh, I was a consultant to him, and in February of 79, he asked me to build a LAN for DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, number two computer company in the world, because he really liked Ethernet. And I declined for two reasons. One is I felt some loyalty to Xerox, and two, I had already built the best LAN I could. And so his wouldn't be nearly as good as Ethernet. And in that meeting, one of us, we don't know, remember who, decided, hey, why don't we just have DEC and Xerox work together on a network, Ethernet, and use it. So Xerox could use the Ethernet 
because it had DEC computers in its printers, and DEC could use Ethernet because it liked to have printers it could talk to from its minis. Why don't they work together? Then we found Intel, who had a chipset uh, idea, so they could do the chips to make this. And we formed a consortium called DICS, DEC, Intel, and Xerox, and began working on uh, this joint project. When suddenly, some lawyers walked into the room. <laughs> and the lawyers said, wait a minute, you're the number two computer company in the world. You're a monopoly Xerox in copiers. Intel, you rule the world in semiconductors. We can't have you meeting like this. You might be meeting in restraint of trade. So they shut down these meetings, much to my embarrassment. So I called my fraternity brother, Howard Charney. Now, does anyone know Howard? He works at Cisco now. And, uh, but then he was a patent lawyer. But he had, been, he, had he had been involved in a suit against IBM, uh, antitrust suit. So I asked Howard, what can I do to get these meetings back on track? Because the lawyers won't let us meet for antitrust reasons. And he said, all you have to do is three things. When you meet, not, don't allow any marketing people into the room. <laughs> because they will, as you saw on a slide earlier today, they will fix prices and do uh, things in restraint of trade. Number two, you need some government observers. And number three is you need, your intent needs to be to make an open industry standard. How are we going to do that? Well, there was a precedent. IEEE 488 had just been standardized. The HPIB instrumentation bus had just been standardized by IEEE, and Don Lockery, may he rest in peace, had been in charge of that. So we contacted Don and others for advice on how to get a project started at IEEE. And, uh, and that was in the dark winter days of December 79. And finally, that committee met in February at the Jack Tar Hotel in San Francisco. And therein, or I'm a little vague about some details, but 802, that was the first meeting of 802. Yes, Jeff, I know it wasn't the first official meeting of 802. That's Gary that said that. Yeah. Sam, another <laughs> trouble with telling stories like this is there's people who might disagree with me about what actually happened here. <laughs> There is a story afoot that 802 got its name from the fact that it meant in 1980 in the second month, 802. But that's disputed by Jeff et al. So here's 802 set up to standardize Ethernet the way IP, HPIB had been standardized by IEEE. And uh, there was another LAN out in the market called ArcNet from DataPoint Corporation. So I was. Uh, assigned to call at data point, which I did, and I spoke to Victor Poor then, may he rest in peace, VP of engineering, and I asked him if data point was interested in submitting ArcNet specs to the IEEE for standardization. And he got back to me after a board meeting and said no, they were uh, preferring a business strategy to pursue ArcNet as a proprietary networking technology. So that cleared the way for Ethernet, except for two other things. General Motors and IBM. <laughs> IBM uh, had uh, licensed a technology called the Token Ring from a patent troll named Olaf Soderblom. And General Motors had a better idea how to build networks. So they invaded uh, 802, and therein began what I call the LAN Wars, which lasted for several years, very brutal. And uh, it was during that period that the IEEE 802 project made a courageous decision, which was to standardize all three, Ethernet, Token Bus, and Token Ring. Uh, the other thing that had Maris Grauby, I don't know if you remember him, but he was the head of 802. And as uh, the committee 802.3 was standardizing Ethernet, we would frequently fight because he would say, Ethernet was that Dick's thing and IEEE 802.3 CSMACD is a different, completely different thing. So we don't, so there's Ethernet and then there's the IEEE thing. And I kept saying, uh, 802.3 CSMACD is not a good sounding brand. 
Ethernet isn't great, but it's a lot better. And so being in charge of Ethernet, I appointed myself in charge of Ethernet. I said, uh, Ethernet is whatever 802 decides it is, Maris. So you can use Ethernet instead of arguing with me about all the differences. So that's 802, and uh, you probably know uh, the remaining 30 years of history better than I. Because, by the way, I got thrown out of 802. Uh, but that's a different story. <laughs> well, we had, we had a big political battle going on between IBM General Motors and the Ethernet Consortium, and there was a big vote coming up. Big vote. Crucial political thing. And Ron Crane and I had taken turns taken turns attending 802 meetings because our company had 12 employees. And suddenly someone said there's a rule that you can't vote unless you attended the previous meeting. So on that pivotal vote, I was uh, uh, excluded from voting and got so upset I never came back to 802, uh, except today to thank you all for uh, 30 years of, uh, of for work. <laughs> So now 802 faces the future, and uh, the principal project I would call the gigification of the Internet. We've taken the Internet from K's to M's, it's now time to take it from M's to G's, and the plumbing of the Internet is now almost entirely Ethernet, and so you're in charge, basically, of gigifying the network, and I think 400 gigs is a great next step, but eventually you're going to have to get to terabit, and I, I just can't wait. The terrifying Ethernet. But speed is not the only dimension along which one uh, innovates networks. Speed is only one of them. So there's speed, and then there's the medium of transmission and cost, and there's the reach, how far out it goes, and the mobility, how quickly the users can move around, latency, jitter, uh, uh, storage and computer now coming into the network. So how does Ethernet relate to the cloud and storage and, and the virtualization of the network? SDN, uh, security, an unsolved problem of the internet, to which Ethernet makes, as far as I can tell, no contribution whatsoever. It, you know, that's the job of people higher up, right? Maybe we should reconsider that. They're not doing such a great job up there on security. And then there's reliability and, then, and also management. For example, in the ongoing battle between LTE and Wi-Fi, LTE is coming on strong, and I think one of the reasons is Wi-Fi's management is terrible and needs to be revised. And incidentally, LTE, do you know what LTE means? It doesn't mean long-term evolution. <laughs> it means leads to Ethernet. <laughs> Almost done. Three, there are big three uh, applications, challenges, that we uh, Ethernet people need to confront, aside from the general gigification of the Internet. Uh, so we're going to take our video traffic that we're now carrying, and our mobile traffic that we're now carrying, and our embedded traffic that we're now ca uh, carrying, and we're going to disrupt education, healthcare, and energy. You know, we, got the, we got the MOOCs coming for education, and those need to be supported by interactive, uh, collaborative uh, television, video. And uh, Ethernet's going to have to carry that. In the case of healthcare, we need personal area networks for constant monitoring for the personal preventive system, uh, healthcare systems in the future. And then there's energy, the smart grid, which you've heard mentioned. And then tonight's special topic, which is transportation and particularly automobiles. So the automobile, my view is it's going to be electric, it's going to be self driving, and it's going to be networked. But it's not going to just be networked with one network. It's going to have three networks, all of which are ripe for AO2 intervention. One of those networks is the network inside the automobile, the car area network. That's sort of the, the easy one. And then there's the network that leaves the car and goes up to the internet to access Google and the cloud and traffic data and entertainment and so on. And then there's a network among the cars that is there's a parking space over here that you ought to know about, is the example I heard last night. So car-to-car -car network, car-to-internet network, and in intra-car network, all of which 
uh, 802 might uh, go after. Might, you might transcend the dots. The dots sort of fractionate 802, but maybe it's time to do a little more work up at the 802.1 architecture level to uh, take on this challenge of, of the automobile. So uh, let me finish with uh, the force, the Ethernet brand, how to approach these problems. And I think what we've learned over the last 30 years or 40 years is that Ethernet has become a brand. And it has these attributes that I'll enumerate, and that brand works. And so I'm urging you to stick with it uh, and uh, go with the force and not go over to the dark side. Uh, Ethernet is native packet mode, um, uh, and it knows where it sits in the levels of the architecture. Ethernet is always built faster than is currently needed. Build it, and they will come. I assure you. When we, went, when we put the first Ethernet on my desk at Xerox, the day before I had 300 baud, the next day I had 3 megabaud. There was no requirements document for that. It took a few years and we filled it up with unanticipated applications. So that's a second attribute of this brand, build it and they will come. 400, hurry up with terabit. And then what's after terabit? 10 terabit, okay. And then there's the third attribute is standard. Uh, 802 standards, starting from a de jure standard. Fourth attribute is that the implementations are generally owned. This is not an open source community. And that leads to fierce competition. It's, it's just wonderful to watch you all carping at each other. I mean, you can't get a Juniper and Cisco guy sitting next to each other without them sort of clawing at each other on the couch. And that's the way it should be because it drives uh, progress, I think. And then there's the, uh, well, you can compete, but you're not allowed to compete by being incompatible. That is, the, the brand carries the implication of interoperability, like that first system programmer's workshop back in, on the internet in 72. Uh, we need to plug our devices together and be sure that they're interoperable so customers will be reassured they can buy uh, from the Ethernet brand. Rapid evolution of the standards uh, based on market interaction and a strong emphasis on backward compatibility, the fact that that same RJ45 can plug into a, a 100 or a 1 or a 10 uh, uh, automatically. So that is, uh, that concludes my remarks. Let me summarize. The work you're doing is extremely important. It's not done yet. The future is bigger than the past, and I'm urging you to approach that future uh, waving the Ethernet brand. Thank you very much.